morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're listening to this. I am Lucy Morris, and welcome to another episode of TheFlyingArcher.com, which is sponsored by New England School of Archer and Supplies, LLC. We have an amazing guest for you today, Mike Lundin. He is a Level 4 NTS coach and the executive director of the Florida Archery Foundation, which is an educational and recreational organization dedicated to the mental, physical, and emotional health of archers of all ages, providing a platform for archers to connect and be inspired. Mike was president of Florida Archery Coach from 2013 to 2015. Before that, he was president of Storage Solutions Record Management till 2013, which was a major international company. In 2013, Mike sold his non-archery company so that he could pursue his life passion of teaching archery. Mike has coached students to dozens of titles in the state and national level, as well as introducing new people to archery. Mike's son, Caleb, is an avid archer competitor and assists in coaching the younger archers. And Mike is the Florida State Director for the Archery Shooters Association since August 2013. We have a lot to discuss, and please welcome from Vero Beach, Florida, Coach Mike Lunding. Hey, Mike. Hi, Lucy. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Hey, Mike. I, I just gave a brief overview and bio. And uh, Mike, sit back, relax, take a minute or two, and tell us a little about your background and how you got into archery. Well, I've always been a an avid outdoors person. And, you know, I enjoy everything that there is in the outdoors, camping, hunting, fishing, um, kayaking, you name it. Um, then when you add in, you know, the fact that I'm a very highly competitive person, mm-hmm. uh, the sport of archery and tournament archery became something that was uh, obviously a, a match made in heaven for me. So um, once I started down the path of competitive archery um, about 20 years ago, uh, I, there, there was no looking back. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and so Mike, Mike and I are going to sit back and talk about archery for a little while. And if you're listening while you're driving your car, please don't worry about taking hands off the wheels. I will take all the notes for you. And I'll have our, the links and resources on my blog, theflyingarcher.com. Hey, Mike, let's start with uh, what kind of bow do you like? Well, uh, I, I prefer, well, my, my bow of choice for competitions and, and for most other things I do is a compound bow. Um, mm-hmm. I, Did you I like do, the joke they say about compound bows? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, do you, what do you think of the joke that people have about compound bows? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, the, the way I the way I look at it is, you know, archery is archery, and I really mm-hmm. try to try to stay away from the you know the the us and them aspect of archery between recurves compounds or maybe Vita shooters and 3D shooters. You know, oh, awesome. um, yeah. my my yeah. motto is that we all shoot archery. So did you started out with a compound? I did start out with a compound. I bought a bow off of a cousin of mine um, for fifty dollars, a bear whitetail, and and you know there's so many people that started with a bear whitetail bow that you know it's an amazing amazing thing, and and that, that's what got me hooked. Oh, cool. What what is your favorite gadget that you have on your bow? Well, you know it. it I'm gonna have to say it's the, the stabilization system um i just really enjoy playing with the the different combos the angles the pitches the weights the the lengths um and and i really think that an archer if they spend some time with that they can get a lot of benefit out of it so what's your your for that part of the bow what's your favorite um accessory with it uh it would it would definitely be the weights you know because the weights the weights have a significant effect on 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 your group sizes and where you place the weights. So uh, that's where I enjoy the experimentation and the different configurations of the weights and then doing some testing at, you know, 40, 50 yards to, to, to verify the patterns. So when, where have you um, traveled for competition as an archer or, you know, as also as a coach? Um, well, typically, during, you know, in, in, a, in any given year, I'm going to travel throughout the United States, you know, anywhere from California to uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Southeast. We spend a lot of time in the Southeast. Um, you know, for as a coach, I definitely spend some time out at uh, the Chula Vista Olympic Training Center. Um, mm-hmm. It's a great place for any coach or archer to go learn a lot more about the sport. Um, and 
and um, hoping to uh, hoping to travel with the uh, international team, with the Junior Dream team, um, as I've applied um, for for a staff position this year. Oh, wonderful! So, so you've been out there as a coach observer. What um, what is it like working with those kids or being around them? Yeah, you know, it's pretty amazing to see the. Uh, you know the dedication that they have, um, not not just in archery, but almost in any, anything that they're doing in life. Because you know they re, it's required that they you know that they maintain grades and physical fitness and and, and archery. Um, and it's just uh, you know it's amazing to see that that there are you young people in our society that really do have dedication to something and and that they're going to be productive members um, of society no matter what they end up doing. It's it's really impressive. I when I've been out there as a coach observer, these they're there for like the junior dream team youth are there for about a week, and they have to keep up with school even though they're doing they're at camp junior dream team camp. They're also keeping up with their homework too. Mhm, that's right. And it's and it's not a very relaxed atmosphere. Like you don't have a lot of downtime either. So yeah, I agree. It's absolutely impressive. And what what is the um craziest weather day you've ever shot in oh gosh you know there's there's been a bunch but you know i, I think the one that, that pops into my head right away is just a couple of years ago shooting in in a, uh, in a in a state championship um and for you know for all uh, for all you that don't know about florida weather the, the the rainstorms can be tremendous they they come in quick they they hit you hard and then they're gone and the rest of the day is decent but while they're here, they are tremendous, and um, it was raining so hard you literally, literally couldn't see any detail on the target. At best, it was a silhouette. The targets were silhouettes, and because there was no lightning involved in this storm, um, you know, the, the show went on. Oh wow! What was it like to shoot in that? Uh, it was difficult, but you know, the 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 funny thing about when things like that happen, and, you know, there, there's people that are prepared for that and there's people that aren't. And the ones that aren't, um, you know, it doesn't matter how well they do in, in, a, in, a, in a normal situation. If they aren't prepared for that kind of scenario and in their own head, then then they're going to fall apart. And and what we I actually shot a higher score on that round than I did on the round the next day in good weather. Um, Basically, you know, I had the mindset that there was really nothing I could do wrong. I just needed to complete my shot, and everybody else, I, 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 in my own mind, I had an advantage because everybody else was was having issues because it was raining. And for me, I just said, you know, this is, I'm, I'm at an advantage over everybody else because of that. So um, I just need to go ahead and shoot my shots, and I literally scored higher that day than I did the next day with no rain. How how do you prepare yourself for weather like that and also your archers? Um, you know, most people when it's bad weather, mm -hmm. they have oh gosh it's windy I'm not going to go out and shoot today that's terrible or you know it's a little bit rainy I'm not going to go out and shoot today. You know I kind of look at the weather and say man it's going to have 15 mile an hour crosswinds today let's go out and shoot and take the whole take the students take myself we'll all go out and shoot and you know you have a lot of fun because you you, you stop worrying so much about every single score that you shoot and yep. you start worrying about just shooting and you have a lot of fun and then when you're preparing for a tournament and it and, and that kind of weather pops up in a tournament you just remind yourself gosh you know what i had a lot of fun shooting in the when, the, the last time it was this windy i'm going to have a lot of fun doing this today and at that point you have a tremendous advantage over everybody else who's looking at it as uh, a negative oh Interesting. So um, attitude's really important of how you face a situation. Absolutely. Attitude, your attitude in facing any situation in any sport, but especially archery, because it is such a mental game, is really, really important. I've had um, classes where I don't have an inside venue, and I teach in different towns in the summer where it's really hot. And some of my classes where the students, the kids have had the best time is when it's been sort of some extreme weather. Um, where I'm, not, I'm not sure. I think it's probably because maybe I become more creative to to get their mind off or I give them enough breaks or we just get through something together. 
uh, I have a homeschool class where we usually start in May or April. I think we started in April. And I showed up, they had just finished like shoveling some snow off and everybody off the grass and everybody was um, in jackets and stuff. And the feedback was like, it was the best class ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, but you're in Florida, so you don't have to think about the snow. No, not the snow, but you'd be surprised when the temperature gets down in the 40s how bad people react to that. And, then, and that's another scenario that we, you know, that we like to practice for. You know, 40, I, I find 40 is kind of cold anyways up here because your hands get cold, the arrows are cold. Um, yeah, 40, yeah, that's cold, and that's like minus 10 here in New Hampshire, minus 10 Fahrenheit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's, you know, and, and when you're not used to it, it's even, it's, it's amplified more, so, you know, really just making sure you practice in, in adverse situations, and, and then making it a fun, a fun thing, and then being able to draw on that memory of it being fun, um, when you are competing in it, it, it changes, it changes everything. And these are actually basic life skills, right? That you can, you can take on into anything else in life, character building. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a that's a primary focus of all of our teaching at, at Florida Archery Foundation is, is, you know, all of our students, whether they're kids, adults, seniors, they're getting they're getting little life skills built into everything that we uh, that we teach on a daily basis, and they really don't even know it. So you are the president of the um, Florida Archery Foundation. What what got you interested in creating a foundation? Well, actually, I'm the executive director. Um, okay. We're, we're, um, I'm employed by a board of directors from the community, um, and the the reason why we why why I decided to go the route of a nonprofit foundation was because we were you know we we had a center for a couple of years, uh, an archery training center, and and the, and we were seeing many many people that wanted to use our services and um, but possibly couldn't afford it um, mm -hmm. we also were seeing people that needed our services in a bigger way than just our normal everyday archery programs and so we you know my wife and I in running that training center we for about two years we funded ourselves and, and realized that it was beyond what we could do on our own so we uh, decided that the nonprofit foundation may be a better way to go for us because then we can get community support for our programs and we can add add to our programs, um, make them bigger and better, serve more people in, in better ways. And, and so that's what we've done. And, and we started that process at the beginning of 2015. We became a 501c3 in May of this year. And we've been just skyrocketing ever since. And it's really a family-run operation. You have your wife and your sons doing and very involved. Yeah, um, we're you know my wife is a facility manager. Um, so we have multiple outdoor ranges, and we're getting ready to add. We have an indoor range. We're getting ready to add to the indoor range. Um, but you know, it, it is a you know everybody in my family is involved. But you know, it, it, it's a community organization now because we are you know. Well, the, the board of directors run run you know is, is my boss and my yeah. and is our boss and and uh, we depend on them for some guidance but uh, yeah no everybody in, in, in my family is involved in it. Oh, that's so wonderful! It's the family's expanded out from the core family to the community. That's that's just, that's just so wonderful, Mike. Uh, uh, yeah, no, we're we're really excited about what we've done already and and really excited about the things that we're getting ready to accomplish in 2016 in the past. What great, I mean, you've been in archery for a while, so you've been reading some books and you really have a lot to offer to the community. And, and what great archery books have you read? Well, you know, pretty much every archery book that comes out, I try to get my hands on. Mm -hmm. Some of the ones that you know are, are, are timeless, and I think probably everybody should read. Um, even though it, this one's been around for a very long time, um, Larry yep. Wise's Four Archery has some very key principles that are pretty much timeless. Um, mm -hmm. You 
you know, apply in, in today's world as they did when he wrote it. Uh, and Larry Wise is still a very active coach and, you know, excellent, excellent active coach. So his, his, what he says, you know, it means a lot to me. Um, another book that comes to mind is Coach Lee's book, uh, Total Archery, and, of course, his other books, you know, on coaching in, in addition to that. Um, I use that book as a reference for, um, you know, in, in, in training the national training system. It's got a lot of great photos. It's got a lot of great explanations of process, and, and so we pretty much use that as our as our textbook and everything that we do for teaching coaches and for teaching students. Do you, do you have a, a particular um, topic or chapter in Larry Wise's book that you can think of that you would like to share with us? Pretty much the topic is, is it's the same the same that carries forth into um, Coach Lee's book. And it, it's the, it's the, the basic method of transferring the um, drawing power from the arms and the front of the body into the back. And, and mm -hmm. it's called two different things, you know, with, with, with different folks. You know, Larry Wise calls it back tension. Um, Coach Lee calls it transfer. Um, but they are essentially the exact same thing. And that is the, the core of the national training system and teaching archery in general. Yeah, because you can get more, way more power by using your core muscles rather than just your, your arms. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and another big factor is injury prevention. You know, keeping the heavier weight on the arms and smaller muscles of your body is, is far less, um, it's far more dangerous than keeping on the big muscle. So, mm -hmm. um, you get less shoulder injuries, less arm injuries, less tendonitis. Um, uh, a lot of different, a lot of different things happen when when you transfer into the back. And and especially, uh, one thing I think about is the shoulder injury. Man, yeah, you mess up your shoulder, then you're um, yeah, you're out of shooting for a while, especially. Yeah, especially. It, it can actually end your shooting career. I mean, I, I've seen it happen um, with people that are shooting incorrectly, shooting too much draw weight, different things. You know, there, there's there's a variety of reasons. But as a coach, you know. My primary responsibility is to, you know, to, to keep the archers safe and to, mm -hmm. to teach them the sport in a way that they enjoy and, and want to keep coming back for. But the safety factor is one that coaches often overlook. How so? Well, you know, uh, I, a lot of coaches, and, and when I say coaches, you know, there's a lot of parents that coach their own kids, and mm -hmm. they're typically looking to increase draw weight, um, and when... When, a, when a, especially a youth who still has their growth plates um, growing, um, when the growth plates are still active, o over bowing a child can cause permanent injury. And, and coaches, par parents as coaches, and even some you know professional coaches don't take that into consideration. They're only looking at the you know today's performance and how much weight can be drawn, the speed of the bow. You know the trajectory at 70 or 50 meters. You know, um, getting them out to their max distance. So that they're looking at the, the the performance indicators as opposed to the safety of the uh, of the of the archer and the athlete. What uh, what resources would you recommend to parents and other people that are coaching their kids, but they might not have a lot of training? Um, what what resource would you recommend them going to to help them have, do more safe things for their kids? I would definitely say any anybody that's dealing with youth in archery needs to um, go through the USA Archery Instructor courses. Um, you know, at least level one, level two. Where, but really, if they really have an involvement with their kid, then they need to go ahead and take it one step further and and, and take it to the level three. You know, become a level three archery coach um, because there's a lot more understanding of what goes on with an archer and with an athlete and physically and mentally when you get up to that level three um, coaching course. I was just thinking also if, if there's a parent that just doesn't have quite the time to invest that much energy in is um, as coaches when we start working with, with our youth and they, and they want to go to say a higher level, sit down and have a conversation with the parent. Hey, you know, um, here's some ideas. I know you want to be really involved. Uh, if so, then hey, come take a class with me. Come do an instructor class, or let me teach it. 
um, and give you the guidance of this is how much weight, um, this is what kind of training we're supposed to be doing for weightlifting and all this and nutrition. Um, so, so to you know, to help the parents realize, you know, you have a choice. You can either let the guy you fired or gal that you fired coach your kid, or invest some of your own time and energy and go and get qualified to teach. Yeah, that's that's very well explained, and that's something that we go through with our parents on a regular basis. And you know, honestly, a, a coach has a lot of hats to wear, and and you know, un unfortunately, it's not just teaching archery; it's it's teaching the parents and. Um, and, and spectators. I mean, there, there's a lot more to it to being an archery coach than just than just teaching the uh, the kids about archery. And that was very well explained on how that, that's actually that's how we handle um, parents that want to be involved. We want parent parental involvement, but it needs to be in an informed manner and, and done the correct way. Oh, very true. I, I had a, a parent come to me with uh, a compound bow that they got from her daughter. And I looked at it, and it's 65 pounds. Um, yeah. And I'm like, no, nope. I'm like, this bow just won't work for you right now. And let, let me do a little research on it just to make sure it is safe. And if, if you do have it taken down, what weight it can go down to. Um, so it's, it's a process of educating the parents, and it's like, you know, don't buy the bow first. Get the class first and, and learn from the coach before you go into testimony. Yeah, that, that's correct. We're very fortunate here um, that at, at we have we have a lot of program equipment, both recurve, we have beginner recurve and intermediate recurve equipment and beginner and intermediate compound equipment. So we can actually have an, a student with us for three or four months before they're even forced to, you know, go out in the world and get their own equipment. And we really prefer it that way. That way they get to try the different disciplines of archery, try the different equipment. Um, we really figure out their form, get their draw lengths correct, and then the equipment can be purchased correctly the first time. Oh, that is so wonderful. Um, I have the same thing here, uh, though I'm, I'm not using compound bows. I have um, the recurve school that I do teach compound people. Um, but sometimes when a parent shows up with something, it's like, really? Oh. Um, but I help them educate them. Um, what, what strategies do you have if equipment breaks in a competition? Well, the strategy for equipment breaking in a competition starts long before the equipment actually breaks. Um, again, similar to the weather situation, um, you've got to put yourself in the situation um, ahead of time so that you understand that it's not a big deal. You understand that um, I've been through this before and I know how to take care of it. Um, so again, you know, it's, we actually have our students, um, we do fake breakdowns. You know, gosh, the peep came untied, the peep moved up. What do you got to do? Um, you know, what equipment do you need to repair? What skills do you need to repair it? You know, you need to call breakdown and leave and go recite in. We run them through all the different scenarios um, so that when it happens, it's not the first time that they've ever seen the scenario, and they just say, okay, coach told me this is what I do. He taught me how to do this. Um, I go ahead and make my repair, and I get back out here to shoot, and there's no loss of mental um, focus on the game, um, which is the whole goal of, of training archers is to make sure to train them to, Keep their mental focus, no matter what's going on around them. Do you find that food impacts their mental focus, or when they're shooting? Well, they're well shooting certain, certainly, certainly does. Um, you know, we train our we train our to, to be as healthy as possible. We have a physical fitness component to our training. We have a nutritional component to our training. Um, but you know, not everybody listens, and and <laughs> whatever whatever they do in their normal life is how I want them to act. That's what I want them to do on, on training day. So, you know, if if you normally eat a uh, donut and cookies for breakfast, don't go out and eat a bowl of oatmeal because that's going to change the physical, your physiological components, and that will affect you mentally. Just do what you always always do um, on tournament day. You're not, not going to make any changes. So, you know, I would prefer them 
to be eating healthy and, and working out. And that's, they, you know, they have a little routine that they would do that, you know, before a training day. But, you know, you know, as well as I do, you, 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 mm -hmm. you can only lead them as far as they'll, as far as they'll go on their own. And, you know, we try to make them be as healthy and, and mentally and physically as possible, but it, it's up to them in the end to, to take your, to take your advice. Well, what's interesting is, you know, a, a student will come and shoot and they'll be like, like, why is this stuff not happening? And and it helps them become aware of food because, you know, I'll talk to the students. So when, when did you last eat? Okay, it's 3 o'clock when, when we're shooting. Oh, I don't know. I had breakfast. I'm like, well, you're low blood sugar. <laughs> yep. um, so they may or may not ever change their habits and, you know, they'll, you know, I give them suggestions of some vegetables to eat or some snacks and stuff. Um, but, but it helps them become aware. Oh, okay, this is how my body's responding after I don't eat or after I eat a lot of sugar. Absolutely. And there, there you go, listeners. I just took half a page of notes. I'll have them at the flyingarcher.com, and you can follow Mike on, well, he has an email address, mlundane at floridaarcherifoundation.com, Facebook, um, Basically, you type in Florida Archery Foundation and find him. And his LinkedIn account is Michael London. London, sorry. Website is www.floridaarcheryfoundation.com. And Twitter is, is at Archery Florida. So you can come to my, my blog and I'll have show notes there with all these resources. Let's get back to um, what do you... What do you do to help yourself stay in the moment when there are a lot of distractions, Mike? Well, you know, I understand that everybody has has their own way of doing this, and you know, for me, it's 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 fairly easy because I'm 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 a fairly introverted person, and I do a lot of uh, self introspection you know, on a regular basis, so I can be around a lot of people and, and, and remain focused on what's going on with me. Um, but you know, I think. The biggest thing that I've found to keep the distractions down to a minimum for me and for my students is to is to teach them that you have to have a game plan. You know, mm -hmm. you have to understand what you're doing during every end or every round or whatever. You know, you have a general plan and when things start getting crazy around you or you know, you start not focusing you need to really think back about your game plan. Okay, this is the third end. Um, what am I supposed to be doing in the third end? Or, you know, this is my, my the last target of the day. Um, you know, what am I supposed to be doing on the last target of the day? And when you can really focus on your game plan, um, that forces you back to the, the more microcosm of what you're supposed to be focused on, which is your individual shots. And um, that's basically what I have every one of my students' game plan boil down to is, you know, it's all about the shot that you're about to take. And when they can focus on that, nothing else matters. That is wonderful. That that's allows the, the archer to not be thinking about the shot that just happened and, you know, falling in the grass and getting all upset about it, but staying focused on what they want to need to do next. Yep, exactly. Which is another thing that can be applied to life too, which is so cool. Oh, that, that's yes, that's definitely a life skill that we all we all should pay more attention to. That. <laughs> what what were your Mike? What was your earlier challenges in archery? Um, you know, without a doubt, it was lack of professional assistance. You know. Mm -hmm. When, when I started shooting, you know, I had a bow that was probably two inches too long for me. I had no, you know, there's no coaches, you know, and you got to remember, a lot has changed since then. This was 20, 25 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. A lot has changed since then. And it's, you know, there are, there is more availability of coaching. Um, but I literally could have saved 10 years of training time with the help of a professional coach um, when I first started. You know, I, I know for a fact there's things that I've spent years on that could have been corrected in a single session with a professional coach. And, you know, that's that's kind of what's led me to be what I am today. Um, I, you know, all the things that I spent so many years learning 
how not to do or how to do. Um, I see them in my brand new archers every day and we're able to correct it instantly and shave tons of time off their learning curve and make it a happier, you know, experience for them. So it sounds like even though you didn't have a professional coach uh, your first 10 years, it actually is allowing you to be more empowered as a coach now from the mistakes and stuff that you learned by accident <laughs> when you first started archery. Oh, there, there's no doubt. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times a week I say, um, it, I understand what you're going through because I went through this. And here's how, here's how I, I was able to deal with it. And this is how I was able to fix it. And now, you know, after doing that so many times, I'm able to not only say, you know, I understand what you're going through. And because I went through it, I can say, you know, listen, I, I understand what you're going through because I went through it. And a lot of my students, a lot of the students go through it and here's how we deal with it and and you know it gives gives my students a really good feeling that they're not the only ones having that problem um and it can be fixed and dealt with do you have something in particular that you tend to see over time that comes up i'm sorry can you repeat that please? that's okay uh do you do you have a particular form issue or something that students are doing that you see is very that, that happens a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think I can think of two things right off the bat. One, one is with compound. One is with recurve. Um, with a compound, almost with it, almost a hundred percent of the time, I don't even need to coach. I don't even need to visibly see the person to coach them for their first session because they they come to us with a compound and a trigger release, and <laughs> somebody's told them how to pull the trigger on a release and. They draw back, they snatch the trigger, and their arrows are going all over the place. And, you know, that's one of the biggest things with, with compounds is nobody's been told the proper method of activating a release, um, whether it be a back tension release, a, a trigger release, a thumb release, doesn't matter what it is. There's one way to activate it that works really well, and um, I see that time and time again with adults and with kids. Uh, with a recurve, you know, it's it's lack of uh, body alignment and uh, drawing the bow uh, into you know an odd position that's where they're where they're just not getting full biomechanic efficiency out of it. And it's I'd say nearly 100% of recurve archers that come to me have that issue when they first come. And same with compounds, nearly 100% of compound archers have that have that have that issue. Are you able to um, correct that issue quickly? Um, I mean, we can definitely correct it. It's up to the individual. You know, I mean, many times people people are resistant to change. Some some people are resistant. Some people aren't. people want to make their correction. They trust in what you're doing. Um, it gets corrected pretty quickly. Um, some people it takes weeks, maybe even months to to gain their trust and and get them to change their ways and then some people of course you know they're stuck in their ways and they're just not going to make a change they're just hoping for some magic pill that a coach can give them and make them be a better archer oh i know i, I had a uh, student that just came to mind who was in my class back in uh, spring and he was at a camp program and he came to me and was like doing something i don't remember exactly what it was but it was more i remember him like my my instructor taught me this i'm like well okay um, I know your instructor is a level one instructor. Um, I, am a, I am a level four coach, but either way, your parents are paying me to teach you. So why don't you listen to me? Um, and sometimes it takes a, a while to get to them. But this, it, but that, but it's very rare that I have somebody that's sort of a kid that's that resistant. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. Why did that happen? Oh, it does. It's. It, it makes it, you know, teaching more fun. If everybody listened to exactly what I told them to do perfectly, it wouldn't be as interesting. Yeah, that, that's a fact. What um, What is the craziest thing that has happened when you were shooting? Oh, man, you know, some really crazy and cool things have happened over the years. But, um, you know, something that really, really comes to mind um, one time we were at an uh, an ASA pro am 
and this was up in Illinois, and it was probably se- was several years ago, six or eight years ago. Um, we were on the, my wife and I were um, in between com- competitive rounds, so we were out on the, the practice range, and the uh, it was a 3D practice range, and there was some a fallow deer out there. For those of you that don't know what a fallow deer is, it looks something like a white tail, but has little white spots all over it. Um, there was a fallow deer target out, and there we walked up to the the shooting stake and there was um a brand new baby fawn white tail fawn trying to nurse on the 3d target and the the fawn didn't understand why it wasn't getting any milk and it wasn't going to leave because he thought it was his mom his mama must have run off when, when he came yeah. baby there. so you know needless to say everybody on the range was had their binoculars out and was watching this and you know eventually the bond did wander off and i'm sure he hooked back up with his mama but it was it was a pretty cool thing to see you you had also um in, in the email that you responded to me about was you had somebody that actually hit a tree with an arrow and it bounced off and hit the target yeah that, that that's happened more than once but the one particular that i'm talking about was you know this was for the last arrow of the day and you know it was for, for the wind for the wind and you know uh this person this little girl was was really nervous and the arrow hit the tree next and bounced into the tent and won the won the event oh that that is just so beautiful yep it's just one of the crazy things that happens and um, what what are you thinking about when you are in the range shooting? Um, you know, I, I really try to stay focused on the moment. Um, you know, I have to try to do what I teach my archers. You know, I have to practice what I preach, and that's you know, think about the game plan. Um, I'm not try. I'm trying. You know, definitely not thinking about score. That's you know, that's what what we teach our archers to avoid. And, you know, think about the game plan. Think about the shot that's about to happen. And um, that usually keeps me pretty well focused. So do you think people are more sort of interested in their scores when they're shooting or trying to keep, um, you know, sort of mentally focused on their form? Oh, no, no. Score, that's that's one of our biggest issues that we deal with on the mental side of, of youth, adults, seniors professionals it doesn't matter who it is the score is the primary focus and um you know it it gen you know i'm not gonna say it never works for people because some people really really dig that and they get and, and it works for them but the overwhelming majority of people when they start thinking about their score and how they are doing compared to their competitors um they're no longer thinking about their shot or their game plan and um, they lose their focus and things generally don't go well for them. You know, that's interesting. It's like we, we do so much work on form, but one of the biggest things is the mental aspect of archery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, the mental, the mental side is something that, um, you know, uh, a really good experienced coach has a lot of things that have happened to them over the years that they can draw on and you know if we we spend now we don't particularly say hey you know what archers today we're going to focus on mental training we build it into their daily training um on a on a regular basis so so that you know from the very first day they come to us there is some aspect of the mental side you know in the beginning you know day one it's just very basic it's just positive reinforcement you know we never say hey don't drop your arm yeah, you know, we would never say, "Hey, don't drop your arm." We say, "Keep your arm up when you shoot, and, and you know, and you'll do better." So, you know, just little things like that from day one, and then, you know, as they stay with us longer and longer, they get more and more. We get more and more involved with it. Well, yeah, day day one, people are so scared, and they're actually so in the moment because they're like totally listening to you, and just just trying to just get that arrow out, you know, just letting it go. Yep. Power yep. Beginner's yep. Mind. Success. How would you describe what it feels like to shoot an arrow, and uh, and telling this to someone who's never shot an arrow before? Well, you know, when somebody really loves it, um, the best thing that I can say, you know, for me, you know, shooting an arrow is like, you know, if I was 
asking somebody to, I'd ask them to think about something that they really love, a memory of something that they really love, and then, you know, relive that moment, you know, time and time again. Well, that's kind of what it is for me for shooting, for shooting an arrow. Oh, wow, Mike. I just noticed the time has just flown by, and you've been an incredible guest. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome, Matt. I would like to give you the last word. Could you leave us with a pearl of wisdom or inspiration that you would like to share? Yeah, you know, and, and this is something that I talk to with about, talk about my with my students all the time. You know, archery is a lifetime sport. Don't you know your successes come in small batches, but over time, you know, you, you get to build something that can last you for a lifetime. And um, you know, stick stick with it and look look for somebody that will reinforce what you're doing and don't think about the bad and your you know your successes will build into whatever it is you decide to build them into. Well hey Mike, thanks for being on the show and all of the links, websites and resources from this podcast, uh, including the books that um, Mike has talked about, will be posted on our website, uh, the flyingarcher.com. Thank you, Lucy. Hey, thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. You're welcome.